listening to the Retail Razor Show, where your expert hosts and their guests cut through the clutter in retail and retail tech to shape the future of retail. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 9 of the Retail Razor Show. I'm your host, Ricardo Belmar. And I'm your co-host, Casey Golden. Welcome retail show listeners to retail's favorite podcast for product junkies, commerce technologists, and everyone else in retail and retail tech alike. Well, Casey, this is the moment many of our fans have been waiting for. It's time for our top 10 retail predictions for 2023. And as a huge bonus, we are recording live and in person in New York City right after the end of the NRF Big Show. We're literally sitting face to face and we never get to do that for this show. <laughs> never. I mean, we're always sitting face to face from the shoulders up. <laughs> In a little square on a screen, but. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to wrap up NRF than sharing our hot takes live. Absolutely. We don't often get to do this live and in person. But first, it's time for the newest segment of our show, Retail Razor Data Blades, where we talk real world numbers and slice through measurable consumer insights. It's a bit like show me the math so I understand where this data is coming from. And bringing us that slicing and dicing of data is Georgina Nelson, CEO of True Rating. True Rating is changing the way retailers track how customers feel against how they spend with an innovative multi-channel feedback solution with an average of 80% response rate from consumers. Georgina will share with us some key data points and offer a bit of insight into what's behind those numbers based on their extensive customer survey data at the point of sale. Welcome, Georgina. Thank you so much for having me. So today's Retail Razor Data Blade segment is how aligning with customer values still plays critical role. So yeah, to that point, we wanted to really find out what was driving consumers' loyalty behavior as, you know, as a time when retailers are, are feeling the the pinch of inflation as of their shoppers. You know, we can often get to this race to the bottom where prices are slashed in desperation to to try and win that customer loyalty. And so we, we asked some simple questions as to what was driving that loyal behavior. Interestingly, we found just over a smidgen over 50%, so 51% of consumers said they were influenced by their loyalty card and by money or vouchers. But a staggering 77% said what actually drives their behavior and their loyalty is whether their retailers' values resonate with them. And they affiliate it with it. And wow. so I think wow. in this modern time of loyalty, you know, that sends a really clear message for retailers to understand what, what values do their customers really affiliate with and how can they market those to them and ensure that that's understood and really build that, build that bond with their consumer base. Yeah, it really backs up the, you know, communicate your brand and your values. Stop talking about price. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even just recently, we've still seen that over 75% of U.S. consumers, they do want to buy ecologically sound products. They do want to buy organic when those choices are available. And so it's really to retailers, you know, don't scrimp on these initiatives just because times might be tough because consumers are still are looking for those and looking for that stance and values to make their choices. Yep. So Georgina, it seems like for this to really be beneficial for the retailers that are going to, like your data is suggesting that they need to lean into this and, and not stop investing, they'd have to really understand how to communicate that to their customers to, to make it really worthwhile and beneficial. Yeah, I you know I think strategies need to be, it's not like a blanket one, one email, one shot in the dark. You know, we really need to have a nuanced understanding of the customer base and what drives that loyalty. And then that needs to be communicated out across a website, across product placements, across mm -hmm. brand messaging. And I think what's important is that, you know, all customers are not alike. You know, there's going to be a mix. And you know, what we see is that mix is more, you know, is obviously very prevalent at a store level. In terms of each store is a snowflake with different customer segmentation and really beginning to understand that at a store level, how, you know, and testing and asking customers, you know, how have your, you know, have they understood the green initiatives which you are pushing? 
Do they understand the drive on organic produce? And, you know, understanding that awareness and then being able to tailor better comms and better marketing is absolutely key. And, and we recommend doing that at a granular store level. I couldn't agree more. Well, that does it for another edition of Retail Razor Blades. Does this mean I get to keep the segment intro music every time? <laughs> Come on the show. <laughs> I think we can arrange that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bo. Absolute pleasure. So now let's get right to those predictions. Ricardo, what would you say there are any underlining themes that we'll see across our 10 predictions? Yeah, I think there are at least two big things. One would be the impact of the economy, of course, that's having on retailer investments and consumer shopping habits. And I think the second is, frankly, Gen Z. We'll see how Gen Z's shopping and buying habits are going to have a bigger impact this year than they have in past years. Let's dive into number one. Private label is taking over our shelves. You all know that I love a good brand and I'm a label of label lover, but a lot of products have become brand neutral with the help of the homogenization of marketplaces like Wayfair and Amazon, marketing convenience over the brands that they carry. Many private label brands are actually in our cupboards without even knowing it. Margin is king, especially during these uncertain economic environments. Retailers need the most control over the product assortment and the bottom line. Finding a lot of Gen Z doesn't have the brand loyalty in CPG that a lot of other generations do. Yeah, I think that's probably a key one right there too, especially after a year of inflation, consumers want lower cost options, but everyone still wants high quality. Nobody wants to go down in price and then get something that's just too cheap and not good enough. But I think the big difference that you just pointed out is that Gen Z doesn't seem to care about brand loyalty, especially not with, with CPGs. Might be a slightly different story if we're talking apparel or home goods, but I think at the end of the day, unless you're buying on the high-end luxury side of home goods, most people don't care what the brand name is on it. It's just whatever looks good and feels good to them. When it's apparel, it all depends on who we're talking about. Department stores, for sure, probably would love to have a third of their sales or more, be their own private labels, but the fact is a lot of them haven't traditionally been good enough for most buyers, but Gen Z doesn't seem to care. No, I mean, gosh, Sheen did like a billion dollars in sales. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does that say? So yeah, I think that that's, a, that's definitely a, a good number one to kick off the list. So let me take us to number two, which for me is, is a big one. And everybody knows I love talking about this topic, and that's retail media networks and how they're going to evolve. This year, it's all going to be about the in-store media experience and how that gets combined with all the digital channels to really make a, a good end-to-end -end media experience that retailers can sell to brands. So everyone likes to debate this a little bit because it seems like a trend. And yes, we all know that Amazon has the majority of the share, but the fact is even if a retailer can get 1% of this total media network share, those are big numbers. And, and they're big numbers that come with big margins. So it really is helpful for a retailer. And if, if we look at some relevant context to this, I mean, you've got a lot of things that are going on that make this special. I mean, one, there's all the first party data that retailers are getting from these media networks, and that's huge. That lets them deliver a really strong return on, the, on advertising spend, right? Good ROAS for the brands. And one of the things we heard during NRF that's a big trend on this that I 100% agree with, you know, you've got a decline in TV advertising in general. Mm -hmm. We've got cookies going away. And, and we've got... The, just in general, right, the digitization of the store, all this stuff kind of combines to make it super attractive to actually put media buys and advertising at the point at which a customer makes a buying decision. So why would this not increase? And there's even, I think, more from that. I mean, you know, we, people also like to debate, where, is the, where are these dollars coming from? You know, brands look at all these media networks and does a brand say, oh, do I have to spend now on 20 different retail networks in addition to all the other ad spend I have? Well, well maybe they do. But the truth is, right, they're going to shift the spend a little bit. So it, the, the answer is, you know, when you ask where do the dollars come from, well, pretty much everywhere else, it's not a retail media network. But I think probably the biggest threat is to Facebook or Meta and to Google because it's their ad dollars spend that's going to go to these retail media networks, Amazon and 100%. everybody else. They're already, brands have already and been shifting these budgets and not by $100,000, but like 
It's big numbers. 875,000 for this month. It's big numbers. It's big numbers. (laughs) It's big numbers. And when you roll in the more advanced networks, they're going to have tie-ins to streaming TV. They're going to have connections into players like Netflix, Hulu, and everybody that are going to tie into it. And it's all comes down to audience data, right? And and when you start applying this in store, let's remember that 85% of all retail sales still happen in stores. So this isn't just an e-commerce play anymore. This is about doing what, you know, Doug Stevens and others used to talk about mm-hmm. the store as, as theater, the store as media. Well, this is the year that we're really going to start to see that because of these retail media networks. And and I think the last thing I'll add to it is the end goal isn't just, I think, the media network. The end goal is for the retailer to introduce a collection of B2B services they can sell to brands or even to other retailers. So sure, Walmart's the obvious first one to do it because of their size and scale, but that doesn't mean that Best Buy couldn't do it or, or any other large enough retailer <clears throat> couldn't take exactly what they're doing in these services, bundle them up and sell them as a package. They're going to have so much more first party customer data. Every brand wants access to that. I agree. And everybody spent a lot of money over the last decade on creating their audience and all of their customer data. So this is just another monetization strategy that they can go ahead and not put it all just into the individual products that they're selling. That's right. That's right. And and I'll just repeat again one reason why I think this is such a a major thing for the year. The margin is better than just selling products to consumers. So while it might not be, you know, it might only be a fraction of your total sales volume, it comes with a good margin. So it just helps the financials for the retailer. So speaking of things that help the financials for the retailer, let's go on to number three. And I think that's all about returns management becoming a top IT investment, particularly powered with AI-based solutions, because every retailer has an issue with returns right now. And it's not just because of of growing e-commerce buy, it's because it's just the new habits that consumers have had to buy more than what they need and return what they don't after they decide. But this has caused massive logistics challenges for retailers, huge cost impact. And it's one thing to say, we just need to get consumers to not return things. But the fact is, you can't just change those buying habits for for consumers. You need to really look at it and say, well, what can I do to prevent the cause of the return in the first place? So yes, we all know that this is hardest to do in apparel because we still have issues with fit. There's new fit tech coming around. We've seen some players in that. More and more of that is going to be made available. Until that gets solved, it's going to be a real challenge to, to improve this situation in apparel. But if we look at any other product category, I think the key is retailers investing in solutions that are going to help them understand why the returns are happening and then make adjustments. And it might even be, in some cases, as simple as your product page description on your e-commerce isn't good enough. And people are buying it but because without realizing it's not what they want in the first place. 100% better images. I'm seeing more 3D images. I'm seeing more videos available on the products. And I think that was pretty much the, one of the main topics that I heard from over the last week has all been about returns. We need to control our returns. We need to reduce our returns. And I think, you know, we still have to remember to... Every single time that package hits the doorstep and we pick it up, we get a dopamine hit. <laughs> <laughs> we really don't need what's in the box. We just wanted that dopamine hit. So there's, you know, there's, there's that too. There's, there's that some, too. Some Which, consumer buying behavior here that has caused some a absolutely. little bit of package addiction. Absolutely, and that has a, a huge sustainability impact. So as we see retailers lean in more into sustainability issues and control, then ha- controlling that returns problem is a big, big part of their sustainability process. So so that's definitely, I think, going to be a huge, again, huge area of investment is this returns yeah. management. If you're a brand or a retailer and you have a, a 35% online return rate, you're not alone. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and that's, you know, at the risk of, no pun intended, but it's just not sustainable to keep having those high return rates. <laughs> Not unless you got a 60% conversion rate. Exactly, exactly. So I'm going to move on to number four, continuing this little mini theme on where the investment dollars are going in technology. Let's talk about store automation and how that's going to help frontline workers and store operations. Why? Because that labor shortage retailers have had in this past year, it's not going away. It's not going away this year. There's still an issue of you, you don't have the staff that you want, which means you need that store team to be more efficient in what they're doing, more productive, but you also need to retain them. And retaining them means you need to make the environment better and and more interesting, more enjoyable for them. So 
what are you going to invest in? You're going to invest in technologies that help get rid of all those mundane tasks that everybody doesn't want to do because they're not complicated. They're just kind of routine and they're tedious. Find ways to automate and get rid of all, all those things. We all want to walk the aisles and do a price change. Yeah, exactly. Which, <laughs> so, so things like electronic shelf labels comes into play here. I mean, that's not even a new technology, right? It's been around for a while, but because of the cost, no one's had a motivation to put it in. Yeah. Now we're starting to see a lot more interest in that because it takes that job away from the store team so they don't have to deal with it and they can do more work in front of a customer. Workforce management, right? More investment in, in shift management, let your employees manage their schedules. That's what every store team employee wants is flexibility in their schedule. Just give it to them. Put the tools in place. Let all your store teams work with a mobile device, have the right tools on it. And then there's new things. We, we've talked on this show before about store associates leading your live streaming efforts from the store, yeah. especially in smaller retailers. There are plenty of associates who are good at this and who probably already have their own live stream effort on YouTube or something on their own time. So why not take advantage of those skills, put those skills to work, which by the way, is going to make that job more interesting. Exactly. For those it, more store interesting. Yeah. It, makes it, it makes it a longer job retention exactly. because what used exactly. to be like, well, I'm going to do this for a year turns into potentially five years and moving actually into right. your marketing department right. over which, time. Which gives you a career path. And the whole goal is to make those jobs, not just jobs, but to turn it into a career path so that this is an area and a field that people want to work in. Yeah. Uh, and that's is going to start with this, this new level of investment in these technologies this year. I agree. I sure know I expect people to know about the product when we walk up to them. Can't do that if they, they don't learn it. Absolutely. And they got to have access to the data and the information or... or they, you can't expect them to know everything as the retailer. So you got to put the information in. Yeah, it's got to be fun. Accessible. Exactly. BNPL. Number five. Explodes or implodes. <laughs> 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 we'll see. But this holiday, BNPL got a big boost, mostly from Gen Z. Regulators have started to look into this in 2022. But the debt this is causing could potentially catch up in 2023. But we're seeing that they are expanding their businesses beyond their core buy now, pay later product by launching new revenue channels, implementing new solutions, or even making new acquisitions to become more than just a BNPL, but to be a marketplace, to be managing customer acquisition and getting more brands and products through as a connection point. I think we'll definitely also see more sustainability and wellness for financial literacy and, and financial wellness tools to increase that engagement and, you know, potentially mitigating some of the regulatory concerns. But I think we'll we'll definitely see something here mature as a product and a, and a space in general and could be a better opportunity for more brands to actually be exposed to some new customers and customer acquisition, much like a, a marketplace. Yeah, I think that I think that one makes sense. And there's definitely, you know, again, that Gen Z connection over the holidays for this one. I, I think you're right. We, we kind of predicted that last year. It didn't totally happen the way we thought it would or mm -hmm. as quickly as we thought. So I think it's it's fair. We're kind of shifting it a little bit to this year because it, it's just inevitable at this point. I, I think the more this grows, the more attention it's going to get the more uh, financial stability issues matter for consumers. So it's going to get looked at. And I think to their credit, right, the BMPL providers, that they know this is coming. Yeah. And that's why they're all kind of protecting themselves, at expanding beyond that core, like you said, Casey, turning into marketplaces. They've changed their and, narratives. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you can kind of say, buy now, pay later in and of itself probably wasn't it, an entire business. It was a feature. It was a feature. So right? it's got to be part um, of something else. And, and that's what drove a lot of those acquisitions. It was a feature, not necessarily the, yep, the company. Exactly. Right? And just coming out of holiday, we've got a, and then going into what many would associate as like a recession or an economic downturn. There's a lot of debt sitting out there and there's multiple players. Yeah. So yeah. definitely, definitely. All right, Casey, bring us to number six. Well, it's 2023 and everyone's a CDP. <laughs> a term that there was a few of us that knew what a CDP was, you know, three years ago. Now it seems to be everybody is a CDP. And at the same time, nobody knows what a CDP is. That's right. It's so true. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. 
<laughs> so one is, you know, essentially brands are continuing to build their own from scratch while the marketplace landscape creates more sophisticated products. These consumer data platforms create a persistent and more unified consumer database and make this data accessible to other systems, really pulling in from all of these multiple sources being able to have this single customer profile and really be able to manage consumer data to support compliance and governmental regulation requirements. This is definitely becoming a bigger and bigger concern over privacy and security, consumer data loss, and and protection in general. It's definitely a high priority for all retailers and brands right now, and even SaaS companies that are processing consumer data. But I think here is where we'll also see a big uptake in more productized solutions coming in with different AI and ML use cases that can be powered because of the efforts going in to scrub all of this data and create these single API to be able to access it. And I think it's going to be able to drive a lot of personalization going forward. So I am very excited about this trend. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that uh, they, while everybody either wants to be a CDP or claims to be a CDP, there's still a lot of confusion over exactly what is a customer data platform when you talk to retailers and understanding what, what can you do with it, what am I going to use it for, and what's the right solution out there for it. And there are different, different products or different needs, just like in any other category. But mm-hmm. this is definitely one that when you look at, uh, you know, like you're saying, anything related to all requirements around privacy and data security, there are new regulations, variations by state, by country. It's just becoming really hard to manage all of this. So if you don't have the right platform underneath it all, then how are you really ever going to comply with everything? Not to mention before you even get to how you're using all this data and your own marketing efforts to consumers. Exactly. Just getting it in one place is one thing and being able to make an edit or a change or validate. Right. These are not simple builds. Right. Yeah, these these yeah. are heavy builds. That's right. And That's this, right. this is going to be involving 40 different other yeah. software companies that are That's plugging right. into That's these right. things. That's right. That's that right. may Choosing or may right. not be new. Yeah. So making the right choices is, is super important. And just making sure you have a good CDP is absolutely critical now. I think this what we're saying. I guess we're saying this is the year that it becomes table stakes. That you just have to have this. Yes. This is not also not a fail fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, Casey, give us number seven. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Programs are definitely going to be evolving beyond a point system or a punch card. I've never seen loyalty take such a center stage as I have in the the last probably four months of conversations and going into 2023. Retention, 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 retention. And I think that all kind of goes back to the CPM cost the lack of performance from Facebook ads, the marketing costs, lower conversion rates, and really being able to engage your customer. We're seeing more paid tiers as a new revenue source for a lot of brands to pay more for better service or or additional perks. And there's the Web3 evolution for the next-gen loyalty programs. And I think this is very interesting because there are so many, how do you communicate and how do you manage these VIPs online and in store across different locations via email. <laughs> yeah, that's going to work well. Right? You know, I mean, right. we, e- at emails the end of that the they're day, likely to ignore, right? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we really go back to an email communication with our customer, which is always one sided. And so managing loyalty programs potentially just by email, not the best utility. And I see a lot of opportunity here with the blockchain and leveraging these different Web3 types of loyalty programs to manage this much better and with unlockables. I think that there's a lot of room here to grow. And I think it's one part of Web3 that makes sense for retail because we don't have 10 VIPs. We have 1.5 million globally. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I think this is one of our more interesting predictions as well, but kind of putting it in context, what do you think then of what Starbucks is doing? I love Starbucks. 
I've never used a loyalty at Starbucks. I pay full price since I should have bought stock when I was like 10. I should own a store. Right. So, I mean, I think that what they've done is great. I'm a big fan of the vendor that they're using, of course. I think we all are. Right. But I, I love the fact that they just moved on Web3 and went on with the loyalty program and really focusing on the retention piece. Because when you are a regular, you are a regular not for a year, but like 20. Right. That's right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we're talking real loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And and we know from not even considering the, the Web3 con- evolution of this, which I think is going to have huge impact, but when you look at the most successful loyalty programs, or I, I will call Starbucks existing one, one of those, mm-hmm. I mean, Ulta Beauty's loyalty program is massively successful. Like a huge, almost all of their customers are in that loyalty program. So it'll be interesting to see how they evolve it. But this is, I, I think this is a big one. And, and I would stress too, you you mentioned it, the idea of having paid tiers and full mm-hmm. membership programs as part of these loyalties. So loyalty is finally becoming more than just a discount. And It and is, it's a club. It's, yeah, exactly. And this is a way exactly. to actually make it a club tier and manage it because right. otherwise you're managing it literally in email segments. Right, and emails that just get ignored. You just, you, they just yeah. get ignored they and just it's ignored. just, it's not a scalable solution. And I think that this could be really, really compelling to be able to scale one, your own loyalty program but to be able to collaborate with other people's loyalty programs. So what if Starbucks loyalty program communicated to Alta's loyalty program? And this oh, is where yeah. Web3 can play. Very interesting, is right? It makes yeah. Where does the, the collaboration come in a yeah, lot to make easier. these and an even more useful and, and valuable club-like relationship? For yeah, I'm consumer. not exporting yeah. my, my email list and giving it to you. It's against, yeah. it's against right. compliance. That's right. I exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> customer data yep all right let's go to number eight and this one kind of referring to as anywhere commerce versus immersive commerce why because we all know that consumers want to transact commerce pretty much anywhere and everywhere they are and yes we everybody says that all the time we all know you can sort of kind of do this with with mobile but the fact is it's still not quite good enough and not always quick enough to meet your in the moment needs with just a phone or, or mobile device. So what's new in this prediction is that the context of where you are and how that changes how you would conduct that transaction. It's not necessarily the same process that you want as a consumer if you're in your car or on the subway or walking down the street versus sitting on your couch or sitting at a desk. I mean, each of these has different requirements in how you shop and how you buy And we've Mm -hmm. kind of generalized them to date, right? And maybe two or three different form factors. That's what we're saying. So so to me, this idea of anywhere commerce is completely new kinds of solutions coming out. Some of them were at CES. Some of them have Mm -hmm. been just started coming out in in the last year. We'll hopefully be talking to some of those in future episodes this year. But it's all about adapting the medium to work in a manner that still reduces that friction, eliminates complexity, and makes it easy to transact commerce for the consumer in that contextual moment. And and that's not quite the same as just saying mobile solves everything. So that's the yeah. anywhere commerce side I mean, of it. we've really, I mean, how many years have we tried to get live inventory feeds for physical stores oh, yeah. to go with right. mapping? Right. I mean, and I've, I keep saying this over and over and over again, like when I'm, you know, speaking with, with people over the, the evolution of commerce, our physical software is just not digitally native. And yeah. so being able to work in real time, it's it's doable. And I think we're we're finally going to get to that point where you're going to know the inventory one block ahead of you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and how it's presented to you matters. So mm-hmm. you might need to know that inventory, but depending on what you're doing, it doesn't do you any good to be shown an image of it, right? Or to be shown how to find it. You just need to be told that it's there. Yeah. And that's all you need to know in that moment. To, to make a decision. So that kind of adaptability, it make, makes a difference and it has an impact on conversion. So that, I think there's that. So now let's talk about the immersive commerce part of this. So that's the anywhere commerce piece. I like immersive commerce as a new term. And, and I'm going to just kind of say this sort of, for me, replaces the broad metaverse discussion. Because I, I kind of, if I break out the AR and the VR pieces for metaverse applications and, and look at, you know, how do you actually expect consumers to engage in commerce? I, I still don't think Every metaverse example we have now implies that everybody's going to sit around with a lot of gear on their head and on their hands. And who wants to do that for hours at a time? Nobody wants who to wants do that Who wants to be for responsible hours. for that for society? Yeah. <laughs> that too. 
So I don't see that yet happening for just general commerce. I mean, I can see it for, you know, if, if you're, if companies are hiring new employees and they want to do some new employee training and onboarding in a metaverse version of their headquarters, I think that's a totally applicable use case that makes a lot of sense when you've got so many people working remotely, but that doesn't mean they're doing it for eight hours a day. It means they might do it for half an hour and then take a break and then come back in another half an hour or, or, or whatever it is. But it's not all day long. And I haven't seen enough examples yet. I mean, the, the whole point to doing this is not just to replicate a store, but to do things that you can't do in a physical space. So we, we had Alan Smithson mm -hmm. on here before talking about the mall in the metaverse, and they're doing it a little differently, yeah. which I think is the right answer to enable you to do things that you couldn't do in the physical space, not just replicate it. But again, let's take the, the technology pieces out of it. And let's look at, for example, AR. You can create as a retailer a really immersive experience with AR that lets someone understand the product, feel like they're engaging it, seeing it, feeling it, touching it without actually having it there. You know, this year's NRF had a lot of hologram demos of uh, showing people what outfits might look like, look very three-dimensional. That's mm -hmm. pretty immersive. I think the one thing coming out of a pandemic, everybody wants to go back to this experiential retail and yeah. that's where the immersive commerce comes in, but you don't have to do it in the metaverse. So if you're a retailer, you know, where am I going to invest money and time and resources to do something that I expect to have a short-term impact this year on consumers buying more from me, I think it's chasing those immersive experiences than chasing a brand new thing that the marketing team wants to do in the metaverse. I agree. And I think it's it's also too, we went with like the metaverse and it's something else and you need to go to it to, I don't know what I would say, like Decentraland had like 31 user, daily active users <laughs> something or something like that. where it's just like, okay, maybe the user adoption, it's too far of a bridge. So now everything's kind of coming back into a web two scope to make it feel more immersive, but it's not necessarily using these technologies that are, are metaverse the way we defined it, I don't know, or end of 2021 all of last year. Right, right. You know, that right. too big a bridge. So now it's kind of changing. So I think it's more about more about what than where. Right. But it's, I mean, that can lead us into the, the Web3 versus Metaverse. Which is uh, our number nine. Which is number nine. Web3 is carving out its space in commerce while the Metaverse is a marketer's new shiny object, you know, where we have this underlining technology that can provide a more scalable utility and a more secure utility for a lot of different commerce applications, but it's not necessarily the metaverse. And I think that there's been some confusion over last year, everybody kind of figuring out what's an NFT, what's a digital right. twin, right? what is fidgetal, right? Like <laughs> all of these different opportunities where, and then we have the crypto crash. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's well, just it like, better. oh, maybe the hype's over. Web3 is a definitely, I feel, here to stay. Digital twinning has become much more operational after all of these players experimenting in it last year. And we'll see more mature products and use cases from streaming the operational and production changes for business processes, for physical apparel, digital apparel, and really being able to leverage almost another type of infrastructure as we go into more scalable and digital digital native software solutions. And the metaverse, I see being more of like that new immersive marketing medium, where instead of it being a flat Instagram image or a reel or a video, this is an opportunity to move from broadcasting to interactive brand experiences becoming the destination, but actually being able to have that fantasy that a lot of brands just can't afford to do in real life, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, Meta and our friend Zuckerberg out, out there really burst the bubble on, on the excitement to this, I think. Everybody thinks that they're just failing by throwing good money after bad. And, and that's soured a lot of people on it. But I agree. The digital twins is probably, the, to me, the top use case mm -hmm. that comes out of the metaverse. It's got real utility. There are lots of brands using that, especially on, yeah. on the CPG side, to do a lot of new product development, model their, their factories and production lines so they don't have to figure out and spend money in the physical world to make changes. They'll know before they make the first change whether it's going to work or not and how much it's going to save exactly. by doing the digital twins. So there's real value there. And I think you're, you're right. The Web3 part of it, you touched on it before on the loyalty program. So that's got... Real, real world value 
in that. So we'll see more of it. Yeah. So I think that's definitely Web3 versus the metaverse. I think Web3 is going to be the winner there this year. So let's move into the last one, number 10, which we would be remiss if we didn't have a predictions episode without talking about all these generative AI solutions that have come up in recent weeks, whether it's ChatGPT and Dolly 2 and all these things. And what does that mean? To me, this is these are cool technologies. These are amazing applications of AI that retailers, just like every other business, are going to figure out where and how are they going to make use of it. So, I mean, you could see something like ChatGPT being used to help write their marketing material, for example. Ricardo, like, why did we not just ask the question in in ChatGPT before the podcast? Yeah, we should. I'm afraid of what it would have told us. <laughs> I'm afraid what it would have told us. I wonder if it would've, we would have matched up to any of the ones it tells us are the the top ten. <laughs> All I right, would really homework. like to know. Okay, so so yeah, m- homework for all our listeners is go ask ChatGPT for the top 10. And my big question, would it list itself as one of the big predictions and <laughs> big trends for the year? Right. <laughs> but if you think about there are tools coming out already to integrate these technologies into other applications, other areas. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of, you know, this, this could have an impact in changing how people search for products. For example, if I'm a retailer and I incorporate this into my app, maybe there's new reasons now as a consumer for me to go into the app and not spend time going to Amazon or Google to search for products. I can just do it in their app and I can do it in a conversational way by just talking to the app. I, I don't, I don't know. I personally don't think there are a lot of people asking Alexa or Siri to help them shop. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, so, it, it comes back to garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, exactly. And so in shopping, we've had a lot of garbage in. Yeah. Right. I just right. want to see pencil skirts that have a double, double kick pleat. I've never seen the word double kick pleat on any e-commerce listing in my life. <laughs> and I have to go store by store. Yeah. But yeah. there's opportunity here. Right. And and now connect the dots on this to our retail media networks and B2B services prediction. I mean, you apply these things to all the media that you're putting into the network and how the retailer interfaces that with the brands. There's impact on both sides of this, right? For the brands and using these technologies to generate the media they're placing into the network on the retailer and how they're presenting it in store on digital screens. There's amazing applications and potential here. I, it's uh, This one, I think at the same time, it's easy to predict. It's also hard to predict because knowing exactly what we're going to see retailers create with this. I, I don't think anybody can legitimately do that right now in January. But I think, you know, it would be foolish not to have this on any predictions list for the year that it's going to have a major impact. No, I mean, it's really interesting. I've spoken to a lot of people in this more on the tech side of the space. Everybody knows what it is. But when I've spoken to some brands and designers and and whatnot, they've never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's too soon. Yeah. There is definitely go- like there should there- we move so fast for, for these these retailers and brands <laughs> on the tech side that, yeah. you know, they can't keep track of all of these yeah. things. Thankfully, there's, you know, a lot of retail consultants and a lot of mm-hmm. technologists that are really diving yeah. into here and finding the value to bring back some type of a solution for brands and retailers with a use case. Yeah. And, and I think this is a lot like what we've been saying and the other predictions is happening with Web3, right? Mm-hmm. Where, we, where we're finally seeing major examples in loyalty, it's where the actual retail tech that's being used in some ways hides all of the complexities and, and things that you have to know to implement on the tech side for this. So the retail, the brand doesn't need to deal with it. The solution yeah. just doesn't. And I think the same thing will happen here. Once we start to see the tools right now, everybody's playing around with the raw capability that chat yeah. GPT gives them or Dolly too. But when that gets integrated with the right tools and APIs so that you can put it in other things, we'll see new retail tech solutions come up that are going to use this but they're going to deliver a business outcome for the retailer of the brand without having to know that this is what's going on in the background. Exactly. They're probably not even going to know. Yeah. And that's what's going to help at scale. What's coming in, right? Right. And I've seen a lot more success on these solutions that when you have the context of the end use case, right? Right. And I'm, right. I think we're just going to see in general, huge push of people from retail that are in tech are going to be making some really big moves in the industry. I think uh, the most need for a retail technology consultant in general. Yeah. It's not yeah. about omnichannel, it's yeah. not about bricks, it's not about clicks. Right. It's literally about getting a technologist to work with you right. that understands the retail business. Yeah. 
there's, there's a big opportunity there for the consultants in the industry and for mm-hmm. all the, the services companies that are going to help with implementations. Because it's a lot of it's a lot of whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Plus running your own business. You know? Exactly. Everybody yeah. has yeah. a job already. Right. right. So K- kind of implied, not so much because it's not really worth as a prediction, but kind of implied across all of these that every retailer is actually focusing on the core business while dealing with all these things. So, yeah, yeah. that's sort of a given to that. All right. Well, that, those are the 10. Those are our 10 predictions. So for all of our listeners and show fans, hit us up on LinkedIn. Give us your comments and feedback. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'll be checking in throughout the year to see how we're doing on these like we did last season mm-hmm. and see what happens from there. I, I've, I've never been more excited for a year to work in my life. Like <laughs> 2023 yeah. is going to be the most fun. Right, right. There's so much <laughs> potential here. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Casey, I think that is a wrap for this episode. Love it. We hope you enjoyed our show and we can't ask you enough to please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts to help us grow and bring you more great episodes. If you don't want to miss a minute of what's next, be sure to smash that subscribe button in your favorite podcast player. And don't forget to check out our show notes for handy links and more deets. I'm your host, Casey Gold. And if you'd like to learn more about the two of us, follow us on Twitter at KCC Golden and Ricardo underscore Belmar, or find us on LinkedIn. Be sure to follow the show on LinkedIn and Twitter at Retail Razor, plus our YouTube channel for videos of each episode and bonus content. I'm your host, Ricardo Belmar. Thanks for joining us. And remember, there's never been a better time to be in retail if you cut through the clutter. Until next time, this is the Retail Razor Show.